had not gotten very far. Because you guys are probably going to want to watch this, or these those of you who aren't here at least are going to want to watch this at some point. So, um, the 15 second recap for the recording is just that going through this diagram um, in terms of dividing it up into acid derivatives above the red line, reduced forms of carbon below the red line. All right, so we looked at a couple of these um, at the end of class on on uh, last Thursday. Um, let's see, remind me, which ones did we go through? I think we talked about number one. Um, and number one, we decided that the we were going to have to do a double reduction to take it all the way from being a um, from being benzoic acid to this phenyl propanol. Um, and the way we would have to do that, and we you know sort of one of the the concepts that I that we brought up was this idea that if you're trying to make a secondary alcohol from a acid derivative, acid derivatives are always going to be at the end of a carbon chain, right? Because that carbon is in that almost fully oxidized state. So if it's an acid derivative, and it's always going to be at the end of the carbon chain, it's always going to be a primary carbon, essentially. If you're trying to make a secondary alcohol, you're going to have to do it in two steps. You have to do a selective hydride addition, and that, and then um, take that and add an ethyl group to it with a Grignard reagent or the other way around. We either need to do step one, add single hydride to reduce it, and then follow that up with Grignard re reagent. Or we could switch the order. We could add an ethyl group first and then add, use lithium aluminum hydride to add the second, to add the hydride second. But if you're trying to take an acid derivative and go to a secondary alcohol, it's always going to look something like this. If you're just trying to make it a primary alcohol, you can just add excess lithium aluminum hydride. If you're trying to make it tertiary, you can just add excess Grignard reagents, as long as the R groups you want to add are the same. Other one, so it would be add single R group and then follow it up with lithium aluminum hydride. Or even at that point, sodium borohydride would work. Once it's not an acid derivative anymore, you don't need the big guns. Um, you can use that more mild producing agent. Um, but lithium aluminum hydride is a pretty common reagent to use, even if it's very, very reactive and somewhat dangerous. Most chemistry labs have a fair bit of lithium aluminum hydride because it's so versatile and strong. Um, if we're trying to add a single hydride to an acid, there were a couple different... Oops, um, there were a couple of different ways to do that. If it was an ester, we had to use that D-I-B-A-H. Um, Diba was the was the region. If it's an acid or any other acid derivative, we're trying to um, selectively reduce it. We use the was it lithium aluminum trialkoxy hydride. And the textbook might reverse some of those, the order on some of those. So we can just look back for a second. Yeah, this one right here over on the on the left hand side. And if we're trying to add just a single R group, um, we'd be using those Gilman reagents, which were that the lithium cuprate. So it was L I C U R. 
that allowed a single R group, but not more than one R group. In the Grignard reagents, you'd get better yield for that, but you can't, Grignard reagents are a little too reactive and too unpredictable um, to get just a single product. If you tried to use, just use one stoichiometric equivalent of a Grignard reagent, you get a mess of products. That's that, that fun quote from our textbook that literally says, Adding, adding one equivalent of Grignard reagent results in a mess of compounds um, is the technical way of describing it, apparently. So if you want to add a single R group, you have to go this route. And so that one wasn't too tricky. If we wanted to, we wanted to look at two, that one's interesting because we do have to add some carbons to this, right? We want to take the bromide, replace it with a methyl group. That then we could turn into an ester. So we know that this last step, we're going to want to do something. We could use acetate as a nucleophile to do this last step. If we had, if we had uh, bromotoluene, for instance, if we had something that had a good leaving group on that carbon where we wanted to add our ester or if we had had it as an alcohol. So if we could make that molecule, we could have acetate act as a, as a nucleophile because we have a good leaving group or if we had benzyl alcohol, we could get to our final product too. Either of those, we could get to our final product by just reacting, reacting it with, in this case, we'd react it with acetic acid or acetic anhydride um, to form the ester. So the question is, how do we get from bromobenzene to bromotoluene or benzyl alcohol? And as I recall, we kind of left it with a couple of options. Anybody think about it over the weekend or uh, anything seem we've got a good option there at this point? Could you just use like a methoxide or something to try to replace the bromine? So if we did, so our, going back to the textbook at this point, um, if we did something that was like a um, aromatic substitution, it would have to be a nucleophilic aromatic substitution, which is a little bit tricky. Yeah, I, we kind of left it with a couple of okay options. Um, let me clear. So aromatic substitution reactions, we look at the review of the reactions. These were our electrophilic ones. And I know that I've got my, my drawings over the top of that. So let me do that. Um, and we know it's not gonna be an electrophilic substitution because all the electrophilic substitutions replaced hydrogens, which I guess in theory, we could do that if we added a methyl group somewhere else on the benzene ring and then had a way to remove the hydrogen or remove the bromine, that would be an option. Um, we don't really have a good way to remove bromines from anything. We could convert, we could do an elimination addition if we wanted to add a strong nucleophile. Um, that's not quite what we're looking for though, right? If we wanted to add a methyl group to it, what other reactions did we have that could add a methyl group? Well, there was, you know, we could do the friedel crafts alkylation, though that doesn't get great yields. Um, although we could 
we could do something along the lines of um, turning it into benzoic acid and then reducing the benzoic acid, the primary alcohol. So in terms of the retro, retro synthesis, the other, another pathway we could go through here, and I'm just gonna put a white box to cover up this bottom one so we have some room to uh, draw structures here. If we could get to benzoic acid, we could get to benzyl alcohol just with excess lithium aluminum hydride. So acylation could work, alkylation could work. We just would need some way to remove the bromine to do that. And so an elimination addition might actually might be the way to go. We're just going to need to, um, especially since that mechanism, elimination addition relies on your leaving group leaves before your nucleophile comes in. So in theory, we could use any nucleophile we really wanted. Um, you just have to do it at a high enough temperature in order to make that work. But since that's not in our textbook explicitly that seems like a um that seems like that wouldn't necessarily work so we could get to benzoic acid from anything that has a carbon with a single hydrogen right because we could do that that uh, benzylic oxidation what are we missing terms of the first step or yeah it seems it seems like there should be a better way to get to adding a carbon that, that the problem is not adding the carbon because we have a couple reactions for that the problem is getting rid of the bromine what if you use so like what, sodium cyanide followed by acid and heat if we used sodium cyanide with acid and heat is that on our Sodium cyanide will turn a. I think it's under um, preparation of nitriles or some reaction of that. I don't remember where I found it. That certainly would be an option if it if it gives us a way of doing that. And given that these problems came out of the carboxylic acid chapter, not a bad idea to be looking at the. Um, carboxylic acid. Yeah, that actually under preparation of carboxylic acid doesn't say anything about doing that with um, with a phenyl bromide. But you know what? This reminds me, phenyl brom bromide. We can turn that into a Grignard reagent, and then we just need to expose it to say bromomethane, and you can add a a carbon that way. We can turn this, if we just expose this to magnesium, we make phenyl magnesium bromide. And now we've got a benzene ring as a nucleophile, which then we could take that and expose it to any number of, of um, different molecules we could pick from, or either where we would be using this to say reduce a um, a ketone or or formaldehyde or um, if we expose this to methyl iodide, we'd be adding a methyl group that would make toluene, and then we could brominate the toluene. That's probably the best the best option. Let me clear the rest of this here. We'll redraw it in a second. Good, and so. One, this is a good example of why I typically assign synthesis problems as a um, open book and as a group 
project because flipping through the various reaction reviews is going to be one of the best ways to figure out how to how to do a lot of these. We expose this then to methyl iodide. We're going to make toluene. Right, because we have methyl iodide, the iodide's a really good leaving group. The, the phenyl has a negative charge. It's, we've turned it into a nucleophile by making it a Grignard reagent. So it can attack the methyl, push off the iodide. We just have an SN2 reaction really happening there. <clears throat> And once we get to toluene, we can do that aromatic or that benzylic oxidation, which from the textbook was back in chapter 17. Not birch. We want the yeah, oxidation, oxidation of anything with a benzylic hydrogen, we just had to expose it to dichromate, we could make benzoic acid out of it. Usually it's sodium dichromate, doesn't really matter, potassium dichromate, as long as the dichromate ion is what matters there. That gives us benzoic acid. And now we're just trying to turn the benzoic acid into, we need to reduce it to be benzyl alcohol. So if we did that with excess lithium aluminum hydride, Now we have benzyl alcohol. Now we're just trying to make an ester from an alcohol. So we could use acetic anhydride. You could even use acetic acid. You'd get the both best yield if you use acetyl chloride or acetic anhydride, which are acetic anhydride is a pretty common molecule as far as stock rooms go. So that would be a a good way to finish this up. If you expose an anhydride to an alcohol, you're going to wind up converting it. You're going to wind up breaking this apart right here, and our oxygen is going to get attached to one of the carbonyls, and you get the deprotonated acid as the other molecule, or just the acid. So that would give us our final product. So if we're making, if we're make, writing it out as a list from our starting material, Magnesium, methyl iodide, dichromate, excess lithium, aluminum, hydride, and last but not least, acetic anhydride. That was a tricky one, that first step. I always forget that if you have if you have a bromine on, if you have bromobenzene, you can turn that into a Grignard reagent. That's one of the, that's the only reaction I can think of that we've gone over that allows you to remove a halogen from a benzene ring. So that might be a good one to pay attention to um, anytime you're, Going to have to start with bromobenzene. That's that's not a bad way to a bad first thing to think of. If we have a this one looks like it's pretty simple. 
Um, but it's a little bit more complicated because we're not, the way it's drawn, it looks like we're trying to, to just replace a carbon with a nitrogen and then the rest of the carbon structure stays the same. But that's not, that's not really how this is going to work, right? We can't just replace a carbon with a nitrogen. That's not a simple thing to do, even though these molecules look like they have very simple structures or similar structures. Breaking apart the carbon chain first um, and turning it into something we could use is going to be a little bit trickier. And so you could take this and do something with um, converting that ketone to an alkyne and then do ozonolysis, or you can do, we, we know we need to change oxidation states though, right? This carbon starts as a ketone and goes to an amide. So we know we have to oxidize it somehow. So going from a ketone to an, if we can get to any acid derivative, we're probably home free, right? Because we're, we've learned that we can convert back and forth between the acid derivatives pretty quickly. So it's a matter of getting it to be an acid derivative that keeps all the R groups where we want it. Um, and I believe our best way for this, can anybody think of what the best way to, to do this might be? Maybe the Bayer Villager oxidation and then try to cleave it right there. Is the Bayer Villager, which one was that? I mixed these up too. Um, is that the one that for the Where aldehydes? You just and, squeeze an oxygen yeah. in between two carbons? Yes. Yep, that's exactly what I was thinking of. So we just need to double check that our migratory aptitude. Um, is going to give us the product that we want, or the, at least one that we can work with. So hydrogen migrates faster than tertiary, which is faster than secondary, or phenyl, which is faster than primary. So we have a primary or a, or sorry, that, um, that would be, yeah, that would be a primary carbon migrating or a secondary carbon migrating. So we, we would wind up inserting an oxygen to the left of the ketone. We wind up with an isopropyl ester if we do that, which we can work with, right? All we have to do now is convert the ester. And so that the conditions for that Bayer Villager oxidation are just a peroxy acid. then we don't really have a way to attach methyl groups to a nitrogen. So we're just going to have to convert it to an amide by using dimethyl amine. And then you're going to make isopropyl alcohol. Because if you expose an, a primary or secondary amine to an ester, we wind up doing a hydrolysis of the ester, get get the molecule we're looking for. Sean, is that a two? Is, there a question? is that a two or a three? The CH. Um... That's a three. If I write really slowly, my stylus works pretty well on my tablet, but I don't have a tendency to write slowly once we know where we're going. Um, yeah, so just dimethylamine. 
would be we would have to use that because we don't have a way at this point of changing what carbons are attached to the nitrogen. And so we're limited. This only works if we have dimethylamine. If, it, um, if we don't have that, this reaction, this pathway wouldn't work. And actually, frankly, we probably don't have a way to make this product if we don't have dimethylamine. Sean, I have a question about that. Did yeah. we, did you skip adding, uh, we just went from adding the dimethylamine from the ester? Or you made it into an alcohol? How did you make it into an alcohol? Wouldn't you have to add acid or something? Um, let me, let me clear my throat. Um, there, clear. So from here, if you have, if you have an ester, you can actually go straight to an amide. Um, we talked about it mostly in the context of taking the ester and turning it into an acid and then turning the acid into an amide. But any of these acid derivatives to the left, you can kind of skip most of these steps. You don't have to go in order. So if we have a way to go all the way straight from the ester straight to the amide, that's usually advantageous. Fewer steps means less waste. Uh, um, gotcha. Less so would, I, would that change the yield though? Or, I mean, that's kind of not really a question, I guess. That would be the, that would be the point, wouldn't it? To, we want to get as good a yield as we can. And so going straight from the ester to the, um, and I'm just going to do it with, uh, with NH3 for the sake of showing this, um, we're just going to, be bringing the nitrogen in, attacking the carbonyl, and then we wind up with this, we make that tetrahedral intermediate, and then we wind up with the oxygen leaving with its electrons. Um, so that's where the alcohol is coming from, is just break the other piece of that ester, winds up turning into the to isopropyl alcohol, and we just wind up attaching our nitrogen where the ester oxygen was attached. Um, so yeah, you you will. I think you'll probably have better if you did it directly rather than if you hydrolyze the ester to make um, butanoic acid and then added the nitrogen source, because that'll give it, just because more steps. Even if each of your steps individually is ninety five percent yield, every step you're going to lose five percent. Then so generally speaking, fewer steps is better. Um, especially since we know both the ester and the acid are roughly the same level of stability and reactivity. Um, there's not a huge driving force when it comes to converting an ester to an acid. So we wouldn't expect to get great yields to do that, but we could get pretty good yields going from an acid or an ester to an amine, or sorry, an amide. Did that, that, blah, blah, blah. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, it did. Um, yeah, i just curious because I thought the whole point of turning it back into a chloride was to make an even better yield back to the amide, but I understand what you're saying. And I guess it's um, probably like percentages. Oh, of you, were, percentages you were saying and, going all the way to the acid chloride. Yeah. And that would be one because there's such a big um thermodynamic driving force it's so downhill in energy to go from the acid chloride to the amide um and it's also pretty downhill in energy using that socl2 is take from the acid is a really really strong um exothermic reaction too so you might not have great yield going from the ester to the acid but then you should have pretty good yields for the other two steps um Probably you still want to do it in a single step. Realist, so, so here's a good um, bringing in lab considerations here. Even if the overall reaction yield, let's say we get like 65% yield up that for the reaction to the acid, and then it's 95 and 95. That's just looking at the reaction itself. That's not considering the fact that each step along the way, you have to purify it. Every time you purify something in a lab, you're going to lose stuff too. 
So the reaction yield might be okay, but then the purification steps along the way, those are adding extra sources of loss too. Even if your purifications are usually, we probably do a recrystallization for each of these. Um, and those recrystallizations, you could get 95% yield on those, but those are still adding another step in the synthesis pathway where you could lose stuff. Um, so I would have, I would probably want to look at the, even if you only got 50% yield here, doing it in one step and getting 50% yield versus you take the others the other way. And, and I'm just making these numbers up. These numbers might not be all that accurate. Um, if you want to know what the overall yield is for a series of reactions where you know the percent yield of each of the steps, we're just going to multiply them all together. So 0 0.95 times 0 0.95 times 0.65 gives you 50, you 59 percent yield and then minus 15 percent for the three purifications um even if we just leave that off because we still have to do oh, purifications okay. here so even if even ignoring that we still would be pretty as long as we can get better than 59 percent yield just going straight from the ester to the amide um, it's probably better to go in one step. Um, yeah, I see what you're saying. So it's, and yeah, it's one of those things that, and this is actually where ab initio calculations can come in handy um, because yeah, one way to do this would be to do both pathways and measure the, the percent yield at the end of um, when you get to your final amide product and compare them that way, but that could take you a fair bit of time um, to do that. But if you can, if you can get an idea of what the reaction energy is going to be for each of the steps along the way, you can actually estimate the equilibrium constant. Because remember our equilibrium constant, we're always um, has that form of equilibrium constant it's E to the minus Delta G over RT. So if you know Delta G for each step of the reaction, you can actually predict what the, what the reaction um, what the equilibrium constant should be for each step. If you know the equilibrium constant for each step, you can work backwards um, and do some math and get an idea of what your percent yield should be at each step. So it winds up being a lot of times um, being able to either look up delta G values first um, and do just use your delta G of formation values like we did in GenChem. Or if it's a molecule that's not been made before, you might have to find out your delta G by calculating the energy of your products and the energy of your reactants, like we've done in lab. <clears throat> um, so it, that is actually one place where that could, especially at an industrial level, um, you don't want to just go in there and start fiddling with things um, and wasting money before you know, have an idea of which way should be faster. Um, that's at least as a computational chemist, that's the way I would have I would have sold my services to the industrial chemistry world. Don't just throw stuff in a beaker. Let me tell you ahead of time which one's going to be faster um, or more efficient. All right. Any other synthesis questions on on those three? Yeah, exactly. Um, the, uh, the experimentalists would be telling their bosses, don't hire the computational guy. It's cheaper to pay for the, uh, for the reagents for me to screw around in lab for a couple of weeks than it is to pay his salary. There's always that fine line, right? <clears throat> yeah, right. no, it's true. Let's I asked, yeah. We can keep moving, but I, I didn't realize what a big question I asked. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's and that's good because I we do need to spend um, you know, I, I always like to bring in labs since you guys are getting less experience in lab with stuff like that compared to to a, a normal year. Um, I'm always willing to stop and talk about lab consideration. It's a good thing to, to do. Let's take our break here. Let's come back at 905 and uh, we will talk about alpha carbons.
Hey, Sean. Uh, can I ask you a question about uh, the articles and stuff? Yeah. Um, I'm, I have to leave early today. Um, so, and I didn't really sign up for any time, but I don't really have any articles either. So I figured we could just talk, but I'm pretty flexible. So I figured I could just take an empty slot. Does that sound good? Or should I just still schedule something? Um, go ahead and schedule something. Just reply to that. Not everybody's filled it in yet anyway. So go ahead and, and pick a time time slot. Um, see if it'll work for you. And if, hopefully between now and then you can find at least one article we could talk about and see if it would work. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping. All right, sounds good.
All right. Um, and just in the name of sharing fun chemistry resources, um, a reminder, I may have shown you guys this video back in GenCam about hydrofluoric acid um, made by the, uh, the Royal, that's one of the universities in um, the UK, University of Nottingham, I think, um, where they test various things. It's called the periodic table of videos. Um, but they basically make a video about every element and then other random questions that people ask um, to the get. Chemists are fascinated by what they've always This one they're talking about HF, hydrofluoric, um, hydrofluoric acid, acid and how if does it actually flesh. dissolve flesh. That we should try it. Um, and it has one of my favorite, one of my favorite chemists ever because he just kind of looks like you would expect an old chemist to look. Um, HF attacks. Your but uh, nerves, it's so I highly recommend watching some of the videos. They're pretty pretty entertaining. They also do one where they they get cesium and drop it in water. And if you can extrapolate from sodium in water, if potassium in water, cesium is even more reactive. Um, just just in general, pretty. If you want to uh, watch random chemistry stuff, they answer some pretty good questions. Oh, it looks like they had a watch party where they actually get. Um, Barry here to watch Breaking Bad, um, which I haven't seen that one. That sounds pretty interesting to me. I think that'd be pretty entertaining. Um, but anyway, um, let's talk a little bit about alpha carbons. So these this mostly applies to class two carbonyls, so aldehydes and ketones. <clears throat> um, but if we have carbonyl carbons, um, they actually have some really unique chemistry in that um, they actually can have, this is one of the few cases where you actually wind up with a reaction happening, not right where a functional group is, but adjacent to a functional group. Um, and so we refer to that as we use this, this naming system based on how close a carbon is to a certain functional group, the carbon that has the functional group, we don't name, it's just the carbonyl carbon. The alpha carbon is one carbon away <clears throat> from the carbonyl carbon. And then so alpha, beta, gamma, um, delta, you continue on with the Greek alphabet if you went any longer than that. Generally, we don't only care about alpha and beta um, because anything that's further away than alpha and beta is not really gonna be that impacted by um, that functional group. Um, alpha carbons in particular are really interesting um, because if you have a ketone, we, we actually saw this reaction um, going from the enol to the ketone. When we first encountered ketones and aldehydes, that's back when we started, looked at alkynes and we looked at addition reactions of alkynes. We said, well, if you make an enol as a result of, of doing a hydration reaction, it'll rearrange itself into the, the keto form. <clears throat> or the aldehyde, depending. Um, but, but because the enol reacts very differently than the carbonyl compound, that gives us some actually some different chemistry on this alpha carbon. So this would be the, the alpha carbon would be right there because you're adjacent to where the ketone was attached. And so because we const if there's any acid or base around, there's constantly a back and forth equilibrium between the enol form and the keto form. Um, and so that's that. And the, um, the name for that equilibrium is the, I can't remember which one goes first. I think it's the keto enol tautomerization. Is that equilibrium back and forth between the, those two forms, the enol and the keto form? Um, and that that gives us some very interesting reactivity just because now all of a sudden we have, we have an alkene and alkenes react 
um, in fairly predictable ways. We've learned back in, I don't know, chapter 11, maybe nine, somewhere way back there last quarter when we started doing addition reactions, right? So if you actually have some of your compound present as the alkene form, then you can do a lot of the alkene reactions. Plus, we can actually get it to stay in the alkene, or sorry, in the enol conformer well, in one version of it. I mean, let me move this figure so you can actually see it on the screen better. Um, this enolate form is just the deprotonated enol. And so if you actually take a ketone, if you take a ketone and you expose it to an acid, you pro protonate the carbonyl. And that's one of the steps to making the enol. Um, but the other thing is if you expose it to a strong base, you can actually get an elimination reaction to happen um, where you basically are stealing a hydrogen from the alpha carbon. And, and then you can wind up with that reacting in a, in a very predictable way um, at the alpha carbon. So generally speaking, if you're at the, if you have just a regular ketone, um, depending on the exact conformer or the exact molecule, about 99 plus percent of that molecule is going to be present as the ketone form. Um, you still have a very, very small amount of the enol form constantly. This is this equilibrium is always happening. Um, although if the if you have a way to stabilize the enol form, you can actually get that to become more common. So if you actually have two ketones that are separated by the alpha carbon, <clears throat> um, there are two reasons why that gets stabilized. If you can, if you make the enol form of one of those ketones then you wind up with the with resonance stabilization where these two pi bonds are now conjugated plus you wind up with the partial negative from one of the ketone or carbonyl carbons um, making a favorable pi or um, hydrogen bond interaction with the enol from the other oxygen um, and so in molecules like this you can actually have the enol form being more prevalent um, which means that we have a pretty good way of, of getting these to react. <clears throat> um, it, this is the mechanism that we've seen this before when we first talked about these tautomerizations. We, we talked about this. And again, that was back in, it would have been back in chapter nine when we first looked at um, the enol keto tautomerization was for the hydration of an alkyne. Which, let's see, yeah, the reactions four and five up here um, actually showed this mechanism as well. So we've seen this mechanism before, but it's been a while. Uh, if it's acid catalyzed, you start by protonating the carbonyl, which gives the oxygen a positive charge. Um, and then we wind up with um, that protonated carbonyl. You can actually wind, um, have that go through an elimination um, to basically counteract that positive charge. So we wind up with there's a, a resonance structure where we put the, where the oxygen has a negative or where the oxygen becomes neutral and the carbon becomes positively charged, which means it's got a vacancy in its, um, in its valence shell. And so it's a just two proton transfer steps in order to cause this to happen. And if you, if you do this with a base, if you do this under basic conditions, it's the same two steps just reversed. We do this under basic conditions. You steal the hydrogen from the alpha carbon first, which gives you a negative charge on a carbon, which can resonate and to make the alkene form. 
and then you protonate the um, alk oxide ion that winds up forming as a result. So it's the, literally the exact same steps, just reversed. And that just means that your resonant stabilizing ion in the middle has a different charge, just like we talked about with um, the acid derivatives. If you're under basic conditions, your intermediates can only be neutral or have a negative charge. If you're under acidic conditions, your intermediates have to be positive or be neutral. <clears throat> um, the other thing that's really interesting about these enols is they actually react a little bit differently than alkenes even because they're very reactive as nucleophiles. The alpha carbon can actually act as a nucleophile in the enol form. So try and draw a resonance structure. If you start from the, the enol form of acetone, actually, if you start from just acetone, draw the enol form, and then try, try to draw a resonance structure that would explain um, why the alpha carbon might be a good nucleophile. So if we start by drawing the, um, the enol form, so we're just basically that the net result is you move a hydrogen from the alpha carbon over to the oxygen. So if we're trying to draw resonance structures, we can't move extra electrons toward the oxygen, even though the oxygen is electronegative, is more electronegative than the carbon, we can't move extra electrons to it to make a pi bond toward the oxygen because it's already got a full valence, right? So this is just like with the aromatics um, with benzene. If you have a lone pair adjacent to the, benz the benzene ring, it was electron donating because it already had a full valence. So the only resonance structures you could draw were moving electrons from a lone pair towards another carbon. So our resonance structure that, that we could draw, the only really resonance structure we could draw would look like look like that. So that gives us a resonance structure where you've got a pretty strong partial negative on that alpha carbon, and a partial negative is going to be attracted to positives. So that's our explanation of, of why enols can be a nucleophile, is because we have a, we might not have very much of the enol, and even when of the um, molecules that are present in the enol form, this is just one of the two resonance structures, but it's a strong enough charge right there that you can actually see this molecule acting as a nucleophile. All right. So here's a, let's do a practice. We practice drawing the mechanism for this. You have three methyl, two butanone in basic conditions. Show them um, the two possible enols that you could make from three methyl, two butanone.
Right. So if we wanted to, to figure out what the two possible enols are that we could make from this from this molecule, we have to look at both alpha carbons. And if the alpha carbons are not identical to each other, then either alpha carbon that has a hydrogen attached, you, this reaction starts um, or ends, depending on whether you're acidic or basic conditions, by removing a hydrogen from an alpha carbon. So if you don't have a hydrogen on an alpha carbon, you can't make that enolate. We're not going to eliminate a carbon going through this mechanism. So if, we, if we're under basic conditions, we're going to start with hydroxide. And that hydroxide can either grab, grab either of these two hydrogens, which means we would wind up with, if it grabbed the blue hydrogen, We would wind up with this intermediate. They grab the green hydrogen. Get that intermediate. And both of those are going to have a resonance structure that looks like. All right, so we wind up with we wind up with the resonance structure that looks like for the green one. That looks like this. For the blue molecule. We get an intermediate that looks like that. And then the second step for both of them is just adding another proton. It's just protonating. So if we have H2O around, either way, it's going to look like proton transfer step. So we would make the two molecules we would make look like that, or down in the bottom left corner. Right, so the again mechanisms, the, just the order of those two steps change if it's acid catalyzed versus base catalyzed. Um, but those would be the two. Enols that we could yeah. make here. Fifteen. Right, so. Um, let's talk a little bit about enolates, which are enols that we deprotonated, where it's basically where you don't do that second proton transfer step. If you're under strong enough basic conditions, you can wind up deprotonating um, you can wind up leaving that OH deprotonated, which means we actually wind up with this this resonance stabilized anion is our actual final product in that case. 
and actually did I yeah um in general would we expect these to be more reactive or less reactive than the enol form probably more reactive but the charge on there it's got a charge and um, it's got a full negative charge which means it's going to be even a even better nucleophile right because our other our enol form was a good nucleophile because you had a partial negative as a result of of a resonance structure this is a full negative charge um that's resonating back and forth so it's going to be even more um strong as a nucleophile um and these are also interesting because this is the first time we've seen what's called an ambidentate nucleophile. Um, dentate actually comes from Latin um, for teeth. I don't remember what the Latin for teeth is, but just like dental. Ambidentate means it can bite from either end. Um, basically, the oxygen can attack or the carbon can attack. And in either case, you're going to get a it's going to act as a nucleophile in either way. It just means that either of these two resonance structures is a possibility. All right, so let's do some more practice. If we, if we take this molecule and we treat it with a strong base, we make an enolate ion. So practice drawing both resonance structures of the enolate. And the hint here, you're only going to make one enolate. You're not, there are not two possibilities for this one. So think about why that might be and which one you're going to make. So this would be one of the resonance structures for the enolate. Why can't we put the pi bond towards the other alpha carbon? No hydrogens to pull off. Exactly. If we tried to do that, even if you didn't realize that, you would wind up drawing a carbon with five bonds. We know that that's a big no-no, right? We're all good enough at counting the four by now that we've forgotten that five exists when it comes to organic chemistry. So we can't have a carbon with five bonds. We're also not going to eliminate an entire methyl group. We're not going to pull an entire carbon off of this. So the only possibility is with the pi bond going to the other alpha carbon. And that means our resonance structure is going to look like that. Remember, anything with a negative charge means we can see that acting as a nucleophile. So we could actually have this acting as a nucleophile to go through an SN2 reaction or any other nucleophilic reaction um, from either the oxygen or the alpha carbon. And realistically means we're going to see both of those if we actually had um, 
this enolate reacting, we're not going to get just one of the possible products. We'd get a mixture of both. Um, so if we want to make an enolate, we need to use a base that has a stronger pKa than the enolate we're trying to make. So if we look at, say, acetone, you need to actually use a base that's got that is um, got a pKa higher than 19.2, which limits us. You basically the only common one above that level is um, amide. NH2 with a negative charge. NH2 with a negative charge is a strong enough base. You could turn acetone into the enolate. Um, however, as you start adding other things to our ketone um, or turn it to an aldehyde, we start seeing that pKa drop. So um, ethanaldehyde is actually pretty easy to deprotonate. And the, in general, we're not going to see a whole lot of yield if we use something that has a smaller, if we're making something with a smaller pKa. If their pKa values are similar to each other though, then at equilibrium, you're gonna have both the ketone and the enolate at the same time. And it's already written on there, but I'll read it out. Why, why might it be significant to have the ketone and the enolate at the same time? What's going to happen if we have both of these molecules present at the same time, Cody? probably going to react with each other, get a different product. Yeah, the, we ha, we're making an enolate, which is a nucleophile, and we know that ketones and aldehydes react with nucleophiles because they have a partial positive, right? So if you have a negative charge on your enolate and a partial positive on your ketone form, We're going to wind up with these reacting with each other and making something that's kind of like a hemiacetal almost. So if we're just drawing these structures the way that it is, let's follow this through to its logical conclusion here. We wound up breaking the pi bond and attaching. We end up making this sort of weird double structure, which then now we have a negative charge on that oxygen again, right? Which means if there's another molecule of ketone around, we can wind up causing a chain reaction here. I mean, this is actually how polymers, how plastics are formed generally, is you put molecules in a um, reaction mixture that's going to allow them to make this chain reaction. You keep making these molecules bigger and bigger and bigger. Every time you add another acetone molecule here, you're making something that will react again with another acetone molecule. Um, and so that's how you take very small molecules and turn it into these big plastic. Um, plastic's not the right term scientifically, but the, the polymers that we see in everyday life that we all plastic are just examples of this. So you can actually wind up with a polymerization reaction happening here, um, which winds up being, unless that's what you wanted to have happen, that's not necessarily good for your, um, for your yields in these reactions.
Um, if we do want to convert the ketones to enolates without that happening, it's actually a, um, if we use a base that turns our hydrogen, our hydrogen into a hydrogen gas um, is, is a pretty good way of making uh, a irreversible enolate because if we're removing the hydrogen from the system, you can't have it reacting backwards the other way to turn back into the ketone. Um, the problem with this is that if you use the wrong hydride source, if you use lithium aluminum hydride, you just wind up adding a hydride. So if you used LiAlH4, that was our way that we used to turn a ketone into an alcohol, right? That was a reducing agent that turned our ketone into an alcohol. So we have to be picky about our, um, our base that we're gonna use, our hydride source, if we can. And so sodium hydride, just NaH gets used because that's a very strong base that will react more quickly make the elimination product rather than the um, reduction product. But even better is if you use a sterically hindered base. Diisopropyl amide is sterically hindered and it's a very strong base. It's got a pKa of, th of 36. Um, and so having having that strong of a pKa means that this reaction won't happen backwards at all. So that's not making a hydride or hydrogen gas that you can remove from the system, but because the difference in the pKa's is so great, you wind up making um, this irreversible process. Um, we don't need to do this if you've got the, what's called a um, beta diketone. A beta diketone means that you're putting your, um, you have two ketones on the beta carbons relative to each other. So that was one of the examples we looked at earlier, where you had when we had this structure. Remember, making the enol was very stabilized because you wind up making a resonance structure, or sorry, you wind up making a uh, conjugation between the two pi bonds. And then you also had that hydrogen bond between the, ox the alcohol and the other ketone. So those you don't even really need to work to make the enolates um, because they're so stable on their own. Um, so we, if you see sodium hydride or um, diisopropyl amide, also known as LDA. Um, then you can wind up making those enolates that way. So here are two, two possibilities. You start with acetone. If you just use hydroxide or ethoxide, you wind up making both the enolate and the ketone at equilibrium. But if you use sodium hydride or LDA, you wind up making the enolate irreversibly. Um, if you have a beta diketone, then all you need to do is use hydroxide or ethoxide, and you wind up making this enolate that has three good resonance structures. Those three good resonance structures are why it's possible to do that, because you could take this resonated over there to put the negative charge on the right-hand oxygen, you could have a resonance structure where it goes the other way. So there's three valid resonance structures to spread that negative charge around. All right. So we have 10 minutes left in lecture. I'm going to leave you with these two practice problems. Um, and we will start class with these on Thursday, going through these. Um, and I will double check, I'll fill in that schedule um, 
for the uh, conferences this afternoon um, as well. So I should be, I'll be back by one and see whoever's first in line, Cody, I think, uh, at one, and we'll talk about your research articles. All right, any, any questions before we break for now? Then everybody have a good morning and I'll see you later this afternoon.